Now we officially start our space day in English and my name is Sanya Stepanovic. Uh, I am a coordinator of this uh, event. Uh, I come from the organization of uh, Montenegro Studies Abroad, OMSA. I'm Alexander Yachimovic. I'm here as the executive director of the organization of Montenegro Studies Abroad. Uh, this is uh, a young initiative that was uh, advanced by the students Many students, many Montenegrin students were studying in countries all over the world, from California all the way to Japan. We have a, a numerous uh, membership, but also we're taking care of a much larger population, of the, we call them CSI, the Montenegrin studying abroad. Um, they are uh, very amazing people, and uh, like Sanya, Sanya is your host for the night, and I'm here, I have a great honor to introduce Sanya as one of our four points of contact for Helsinki and Finland uh, and Baltic region. Uh, Sanya is a PhD student in Alta University and uh, uh, she's our, one of our first members, one of our fighting uh, people from, 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 who worked with OMSA from the start. What uh, is very important to say about OMSA is that it's just getting the momentum and we are very much appreciative of all of the people who know other Montenegrin students who study abroad to connect to our website and join our, our common work and our research energy. OMSA is all about information sharing and networking and creating a very strong network that can support Montenegro society and its development uh, from all over the world by transferring the knowledge and transferring the resources and lobbying for the causes that can help develop Montenegro society. Uh, and we have a great human capital that is waiting to be explored and abroad. Um, and uh, thus far, we are operating in 16 different countries, group of countries, and uh, we're taking care of around 500 people who are CSI. Uh, that's for me, I just wanted to introduce the organization. I will now give the word to Sanya as the, the main host of the evening. Please have an applause for me. Thank you. Uh, once again, welcome. We are really happy to see you in so large number tonight. We are very pleased. And uh, before starting our event, uh, I would be really happy uh, to thank to uh, our partners and supporters. First of all, to the Ministry of Science, which enabled us that uh, our event is part of Open Science Days and that we can be here tonight in this uh, nice space. Uh, after that, we want to thank to our main partner, which is the Embassy of United Arab Emirates in Montenegro, and as well uh, to the French Institute in Montenegro. So, uh, what is the idea behind Space Day? Most of you might be surprised uh, how come Montenegro and space, uh, but uh, we wanted to uh, bring some new ideas to Montenegro and show that space space industry and space science are actually, um, even for so small countries such as Montenegro, uh, interesting and you can see that many of you uh, might even find uh, possibilities to join that uh, sector and uh, for, we bring uh, five uh, experts from space domain, uh, young uh, experts coming from different areas in the uh, space sector who will tell you about their life about their work, progress, success, and uh, hopefully inspire you for uh, one new uh, space idea. So our first speaker for tonight is Mr. Ashley Dale, uh, who comes from <laughs> UK. And Ashley will present to us about um, sending human man mission to Mars and about different implications of such idea. Welcome, Ashi. Is this all? Yeah, okay. Ashley, you have to switch it on. Yeah. So. 
I was born in the uh, Kalahari Desert in uh, Namibia to uh, a South African mother that was uh, stricken with malaria at the time uh, in what they called uh, a hospital. Uh, after my birth, for the first couple of years of my life, I spent my time being taken to and from the hospital because my little lungs um, couldn't really deal with the humidity in Namibia and the, the dust in the air. And as soon as my parents found themselves jobs in South Africa, uh, we moved down there. And the, uh, the environment in South Africa is much like here in Montenegro. I lived on the, uh, the coast of Cape Town, absolutely beautiful. Um, having the beach for a back garden was uh, great. But being the early 90s in South Africa, uh, it was not a particularly easy time. Uh, we were robbed many, many times. T typically at gunpoint. Um, our record was three robberies, three house robberies in two weeks. It was quite bad. But. Uh, a lot of people had blood on their hands, um, even Nelson Mandela. Uh, he was not put in a prison 20 kilometers off the coast of Cape Town for 27 years for peaceful protesting. There was uh, a lot of conflict. And uh, even my mother was a, a commander of a riot control squad in Cape Town. So it was an interesting time. But uh, things for us changed. Things for us changed. My, my mother's father died and we moved into the mountains of uh, South Africa, into the Amatola region to support her mother. And, uh, yeah. So we moved into the mountains and uh, things were quieter there, but being the only white kid in a, a school of 200 black kids was uh, character building to say the least immediately post-apartheid. And I had to grow up quite quickly in this, in this environment. It was not exactly conducive to an academic education. And for some years, I, I did not go to school. The time I spent outside of school, um, I was lucky in that our village had a little library. Library being a generous word, but uh, it had some books inside. And for, several, for the several years that I was outside of school, I, I dare say that I read every book in that library. And outside of that, I... I roamed around the mountains as a kid with the dogs and, and really fell in love with nature. Uh, to be fair, living in a subtropical rainforest and not falling in love with nature would be more of an achievement, but I did. It, uh, it, it developed me. And that is where I, uh, I discovered the sky. As a small kid, finding out that those little dots in the sky were actually vast nuclear furnaces at distances in kilometers greater than the number of words that have ever been spoken in the human language on this planet. And that some of that light that was blasted off those stars had traveled all of that distance just to get caught in my eye. It, it blew my mind as a kid. Fast forward a decade, uh, my mother found a job in Los Angeles and she remarried to quite a brave Englishman. Um, 
I spent my time hopping around schools in South Africa, in the United States, in Belgium, and in the United Kingdom. Uh, traveling through all these countries, uh, I, I came to realize that the rules by which you live your life, the rules by which you're supposed to conform to in those countries, they're not really real. And in that instability, Growing up, I, I sort of developed a stability in myself. And starting out in Namibia, the sand bushman of the Kalahari, education in the Amatola Mountains with the Tosa tribes, I now am in the ivory tower of academia, finishing up my PhD in aerospace engineering. It's, uh, it's been quite a journey already. I, I now live in Bristol, a lovely city, I recommend going to it. Not too long ago, I was part of a crew of mostly NASA and ESA scientists and engineers and architects. And what we did was we were put into an astronauts on Mars simulation study in the high altitude desert of Utah for two weeks, uh, constantly being observed um, being put through psychological studies, uh, protocol studies, uh, selection procedure studies for astronauts. Oh, I wish I had so many slides. This is the Mars Desert Research Station. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a module where they conduct uh, astronaut and Mars simulations, uh, developing field, task, field tactics for astronauts on Mars. Uh, next slide. Um, and whilst, uh, whilst they were conducting these studies on us, uh, we were conducting our own research there. And uh, could you go to the next slide, please? And again. It's a beautiful region, and it was chosen particularly because uh, of its geological likeness to Mars. So it allowed for a lot of uh, hardware testing to be done with uh, rovers and, and other types of instruments. Could we move on, please? Next, please. And again. An amazing landscape. It was a very intense experience and I, as a, a first year PhD student at the time, somehow getting onto this really quite highly qualified crew, how did I do it? Well, my advice to you, whenever you're going to be faced with any real long shot applications, as eloquently as possible, trench everything with passion. I will be leading uh, another crew early next year into the simulation, again with some NASA and ESA scientists and engineers. And we'll be field testing a, a Mars rover. We will be field testing a, a, a Mars drone that's been tailored to fly in the very thin Martian atmosphere. We're, we've got some astronaut suit technologies that we'll be uh, testing. We've got uh, some field work we'll be conducting where we'll be trying to make rocket fuel out of the desert soil, a feasibility study. We will be conducting extreme weather testing on microbes, microbe candidates that would be used in terraforming the Martian atmosphere. We're doing a lot of good things. But my, my actual research, my PhD, is into the future of aircraft design. 
morphing aircraft, green aircraft, but I'm not going to talk to you about that. Next slide. Creating greener aircraft, uh, looking at my research, trying to find a motivation for my research when I started out, I came to realize a problem that we're facing. It's, it's really quite obvious when you think about it, but nobody really talks about it day to day. And this problem is that the world we live on, it is, it's finite. It's the, the resources on our planet that we share are limited. Working on greener aircraft, making aircraft use less fuel and produce less greenhouse gases is still commendable, I, I think, but don't be fooled into thinking it is a, a solution to this problem that we're facing. It's simply a speed bump. The world we live on is eventually going to collapse if we continue to live the way we do. It's almost like the law of entropy. We have these resources, we, we, we engineer the environment to our liking instead of living in lockstep with the environment around us like the rest of the animals. It's, this, is, this is a real problem. Next slide, please. And the problem is in sharing our resources. If in effect, if we remain locked to the planet, we are effectively each other's enemies fighting for the remaining resources on the planet. A war? Organized war is not some human instinct or break away from rationality. It's a highly planned and elaborate, highly cooperative form of theft. And as Carl Sagan once said, an organism at war with itself is doomed. So what, what do we do? What, is, what, is, what are our options? Now, before I get there, there will always be issues that we face today that, that are of apparent greater importance to us than, than space. But I think that we need to find the right balance between our near-term and long-term problems. There will always be poverty, there will always be people suffering, just by the nature of the way we see things, we will just be moving these yardsticks around. Poverty today is not what it was 100 years ago. But we will always have these differences. And as I say, I think we need to find the right balance between looking at near-term and long-term problems. And with the world spending seven times more on cosmetics today than it spends on its space agencies, I question whether we have the right balance. So, what am I trying to say to you? What, what, is, what do I think we need to do? What we need to think about quite seriously? And that is, we need to think about Mars. Mars is the next logical step for humanity. It is, compared to the moon, the moon is like Greenland was compared to America in the previous age of exploration. Uh, don't get me wrong, the, the moon would be very useful for testing hardware and systems that would be used for Mars, but it simply doesn't have the resources that a technological civilization needs. Mars does. It has all of the materials, all of the irons that we use today as a civilization, the moon does not. Next slide. And with a relatively small push from humanity, there is a very real possibility that we could change the environment on Mars to something we could actually live on. <laughs> Next slide. You know, uh, an unexpected consequence of the Apollo era, where the Americans were set on getting a man to the moon and back, was that at every level, from high school through to PhD, the number of students in science, in engineering, in, in mathematics, the, the number of students throughout the Apollo era doubled. And then after the Apollo era, it dipped off again. What, what they did inspired a generation. And 
to double the scientific literacy of your nation in a world that is so dependent on science and technology was a very good move for the US and turned them into what they are today. Next slide. I'm not trying to say humanity is doomed. Uh, this, this might come across as quite depressing at the moment. I mean, when you think of it, NASA budgeted how much it would cost to set up the architecture around, um, to build the vehicles and to launch the first mission to Mars. They made a budget of how much this would cost them in the early 90s, and it came to about $50 billion. We've had the technology to go to Mars for nearly two decades now. There's no, nothing needs to be invented. But what, what, what does $50 billion mean um, in context for the United States? Well, $50 billion is two weeks worth of the US defense spending, the annual defense spending. And there have been over a thousand weeks since they put together this plan. And I've spoken to more than a dozen astronauts uh, a great deal of the leading figures in the space agencies around the world and asked them all one question, why have we not got people on Mars yet? And they've all answered with one, one response. It's political inertia. There, there is no real will to do it in the West. But I, I am confident that we will get there. Uh, next slide, please. I'm not saying humanity is doomed. I do think we'll get there because what I, what, I, what I am actually saying is do not assume that we will go to Mars on NASA or ESA rockets with NASA or ESA astronauts. As Jacob Bronowski once said, humanity has a right to change its colors. If America doesn't take the next step, it will be simply taken by somebody else. America has not been given any guarantees that superpowers of the past were not given, like the Assyrians or the Ottoman Empire or, or the Egyptians. Next slide, please. Humanity needs to go to Mars. Our, our time is limited. I'm confident it will happen. We must survive, or we must evolve back to our pre-Stone Age existence, living in lockstep with the environment like the rest of the animals. We only have two options. Obviously I choose that we need to spread. But maybe, maybe it's the, the red sands of the Kalahari Desert calling me home. Who knows? Johnson, Dr. Michael Johnson from Ireland, uh, who will be telling us about uh, robots, about uh, swarm robots, and their applications uh, for the uh, research on Mars and in space. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, um, I'm here today to talk about robots and rovers, automated um, robots that will be used to explore far reaches of space we hope. So um, hopefully everyone can understand my Irish accent. Right? If you need me to talk slower, do this. If you need me to speak louder, do this. Okay. So Okay, so. Okay, next slide. Okay, so in the next 20 minutes, 
I will hopefully cover um, what are robots, what do we mean when we say the word robot. Um, I'm going to talk about a particular type of robot, um, swarm robots. Okay, um, a very brief introduction to Mars rover, where it is at the moment, and where it will hopefully go in the future. Okay, so it's I. Okay. Okay, so first off, what do we mean when we say robot? Okay, so next slide. Okay, so there are many definitions for the word robot. Okay, the original word came from Czech. Um, it was used in the 1920s in the play. Okay, um, one definition is a machine that imitates a human. Another definition is a machine that has intelligence, sensors, motion, and energy or power. Okay, um, next slide. Okay. Using those definitions, there are many, many machines out there at the moment that can be termed robots. Okay, they vary from the Lego Mindstorm, which comes in at 250 euros per robot, to the Mars Rover, which comes in at 2.5 billion US dollars per robot and everything in between. Um, when I say the word robot, what you're probably picturing is maybe one of the robots on that page, okay? Um, movies, TVs, right, especially in the last 20, 30 years, have basically colored our perception of what robots are and what they're capable of doing. We go on, right? But um, surprisingly, the science fact or the actual real world robotics is catching up really well with what um, Hollywood would have us believe robots are. Okay, uh, for example, go back a minute, right? Uh, top left here we have Tokyo. It's a uh, ping pong playing robot. It's able to play ping pong against a human and it's able to learn. So the longer it plays, the better it gets. Okay, um, Asimo here is a robot developed by Honda. It's a personal assistant robot. It has conducted the New York Philharmonic Orchestra on its own, on Aiden. Um, Big Dog is a Boston Dynamics uh, robot at the moment in development. It is capable of uh, basically acting as a robotic pack mule. It's able to stabilize itself over uneven territory, uh, travel at 4.5 miles an hour, and basically carry 150 kilos of weight, okay, for someone to steer. So, the one area of robotics I want to focus in on is where I'm researching at the moment is what's called swarm robotics. So, next, okay. So, what's a swarm robot? Very simply, um, they're very simple robots, but there are many, many of them. Okay. Each robot is very, very basic. It doesn't necessarily have a lot of complexity in it, but there is an entire fleet of the two robots working together to do task. Go on. Right. The robots work together as a unit, and by working together, they achieve the goal or the task that they have been set out. So that could be to find water, to map the terrain, search for signs of life on Mars, okay? They work together and they go on task. Um, again, Hollywood, yep, yeah, um, Hollywood has uh, kind of, what's the word, cashed in on the swarm robotics phase as well. So uh, a good example is the Droid Army from Star Wars, okay? Uh, individually, each robot, really basic, really simple. But put them all together into one big army, right, and they complement it. Okay, next. Um, this is an example of some swarm robots that are in use today. Um, typically, a swarm is 10 or more robots. So if I have 10 robots working together, technically I can call it a swarm. Okay, they can be land, sea, or air based. So I can have a swarm of robots in the sea, up in the air, or on the ground. Um, next, okay. So, I'm going to switch back now and look at um, 
planetary explorers, so robots that are being used to investigate planets in our solar system, and at the moment, that means Mars, okay? Go on, right? So Mars is the only planet, or the only object in the solar system that we have sent automated robots to at this stage, okay? We've sent four robots to date to Mars, right? The last 15 years, we have had four different robots up on the red planet. It is 350 million miles away. A signal from Earth takes 14 minutes to get to Mars, 28 minutes if you need a response. So there's no such thing as fast reaction, okay? Um, said there were four robots. Sojourner was the first one. That was in 1997. It was part of the Pathfinder mission. It explored the planet for three months and it weighed about 10 kilos. Um, Spirit and Opportunity were the next robots sent. They were sent as a joint mission three weeks apart in 2004. Um, they weighed about 180 kilos each, which is twice the weight of an average male. Okay, um, no, come back on it, right? Spirit is um, stopped functioning as of March 2010, so it's defunct. Opportunity is still running. Opportunity has gone 20 miles now over the Martian terrain, and Curiosity is the current rover that's up there, and that's actually done 25 kilometers to date, right, and traveling around Mars. Okay, right. The name Curiosity um, came from an essay competition that NASA ran. A 12 year old sixth grader from Kansas won the competition and got to name the robot, and she chose the name Curiosity. Um, its official title is the Mars Science Laboratory. Okay, next. Right. It weighs 900 kilos or 1,900 pounds, which is about the weight of a Mini Cooper. So a small hatchback car is about the same weight as your Mars rover. Um, your iPhone is four times more powerful than the Mars rover. Okay. Um, your home PC is 10 times more powerful. So. Um, as you can see, $2 billion, they didn't necessarily get the best deal, but they got to put it on Mars, so what harm? Next. Okay. Um, the rover has an impressive science complement or payload. Okay, it has 17 cameras on board. It has a full weather station, so it's able to measure wind speed, humidity, temperature, pressure. Um, it's got a radiation detector. So it's basically able to detect radiation, uh, take the textile samples, analyze them for minerals, water, and or life. Okay, next. Um, and there are two future Mars missions being planned. The one on the right is the Exo Mars mission, which will hopefully land on Mars in 2018. Okay, that's a mission run by Russia and ESA, the European Space Agency. And again, its mission is to search for science of life. Um, this guy here is the next generation Mars rover, which will hopefully be in development for 2020. That will be launched and hopefully arrive sometime in the 20s on Mars. Its mission will be to search again for signs of life, but this time going back over thousands of years. Okay, and hopefully it will also send us back samples of Mars soil to Earth, okay? So that's where we are at the moment with the Mars rover and rovers in general. So we are going to now take a step forward and say, what's the future, okay? So what could we do, okay? And particularly, what can we do if we use something like swarm robots? So instead of sending one rover, why don't we send 10 or 20 or 100, okay? Next. Right? So why would you send multiple robots? Well, one, they get the job done faster. If I'm looking to map the surface of Mars, it's going to take one robot hundreds of days. It's going to take two robots half that time. It's going to take ten robots a tenth that time. So the more robots I can send, the faster I can get it mapped. Okay, next. Um, the more rovers I have, the more ground I cover. Okay, the more interesting stuff I can find. If I'm looking for signs of life, I have a better chance of finding it. If I'm looking for water, I have a better chance of finding it. 
Okay. Um, each robot will have a sensor on board. So the more rovers I have, the more sensors I have on the planet. Okay. So again, the more probability I have of finding interesting stuff happening on Mars. Next. Um, if you do it right, the more robots I make, the cheaper each robot becomes. Okay. If I make one robot, it costs me a certain amount of money. To make the second robot is a lot less. To make the third robot, less again. Okay. So ideally, I want to be making however many rovers I need to be basically having an optimum price out of them. Uh, next. Right. And the final thing is, they're fault tolerant. If one rover breaks, okay, it's broken, but I have 19 others, or I have 29 others, or however many, okay? And potentially, I can get a robot to fix another robot. So, that point of view, okay? These are some examples of robots that are either in development or in use at the moment, and are actually potential candidates for swarms, okay? Um, the interesting ones, this guy up here is an idea proposed by Marco Pavone from NASA. Uh, they're called uh, reduced gravity rovers. And the idea is that they would be exploring, um, say, the moons of Mars or basically objects with reduced gravity. They bounce around like a beach ball, okay? And they're able to travel a really long distance between touchdown, okay? So they're able to cover a lot of distance in a very short time. Okay, um, go back for a minute. Right, the guy down the bottom here is being developed by MAST, which is a uh, multi-autonomous science and technology group in uh, Georgia Tech in Atlanta. It's basically a robotic spider. Okay, they are currently uh, developing a swarm of them to essentially, as they say, go places where humans cannot go because of access or because it's too dangerous, right? Ours cannot access it and it's too dangerous for it at the moment. So they're a prime candidate. Uh, moving on. So the next slide. Um, there are a lot of very cool robots out there. Okay, really cool and a lot of work has gone into them and this is only, as I said, a, a very brief sample of them. The hexapod here, right, is a robot that is in development. It moves around on six legs. You can turn it upside down, it will automatically right itself, okay, and be able to move. It can tuck its legs in from a sphere and it can roll around the ground. So it has dual means of locomotion. Um, the guy in the bottom right is called a sand flea. It's developed by Boston Dynamic. It rolls around on its wheels, but it also has a spring underneath, which allows it to jump 30 feet in the air. So, as they say on the website, it can jump small buildings in a single bound. Okay, moving on. All right, so that was just a very brief run through what are robots, what are swarm robots, where are robots at the moment in space, where would we like them to go? Okay, 2012 was the 50th anniversary of planetary exploration. Mariner 1 was launched. 51 years ago now, okay? So in 50 years, we have put four robots on the moon, or sorry, on Mars. In another 50 years, where are we going to be? Are we going to have manned outposts on Mars? Are we going to be using that as a forward base to explore the rest of the cosmos? Go on, right? So there's a lot out there that we can explore, okay? And said, if we get as far as Mars, we have Jupiter there, we have the moons of Jupiter, Io and Europa, we have Titan and Saturn, we have the outer planets, the asteroid belt. There's there's a lot out there that we can look at and he said, robots are here to stay, they're only going to get bigger and more important in our technology and in our um, society. So I said, on that note, I will leave you. Um, thank you very much for listening to me and I hope you enjoyed the talk. Exploration is, is a natural, uh, exploration is a natural desire of humanity. We need to explore as well as we need to breathe. That's why uh, as our knowledge is growing, we need to open new doors 
and go, uh, going forward, exploring something new beyond Earth. As Konstantin Tsiolkovsky said, Earth is a cradle of humanity, but one cannot live in a cradle forever. So we made our first steps, first space station, first uh, space flight, flight to the moon. But what will be our next destination point? It depends on us. Analyzing uh, other planets, we can make some conclusions. So, the moon has no atmosphere, no water, it has low gravity, and isn't it too easy to explore the moon? So, Mercury looks like a small bowling icy ball, and uh, it's not suitable for life. Uh, next planet is Venus. We know how toxic it is, so it, again it's not our situation. And uh, giant planets are too far away, they are too, um, too poorly studied, and uh, they are made from gas, uh, so, and Pluto is not a planet anymore. So we have a Venus. it's Mars, the most Earth-like planet. But how, will, uh, how long will it take the mission to Mars? So let's compare. One year journey is uh, around 360 days, uh, and the round trip to Mars will be uh, 520 days, but it's unrealistic minimum, because in reality it will take longer. Did we have something similar on, on board the space station? Well, only once uh, one person stayed on board the space station for 430 days. How you can see, there is difference, and this difference is very important. Also, uh, there is a very, very uh, big difference between uh, interplanetary flight and fl uh, flight on board of space station. Uh, first point uh, is um, uh, a, a very relevant time delay, which uh, will appear. Uh, this delay means that crew members will need to stay uh, um, uh, without mission control center help. Uh, and it means that crew members will need to take decisions by themselves. And also, one very big problem is isolation. Can you imagine living 520 days in the same round of people? Uh, even uh, during this long mission on board the space station, the person was staying alone, but the crew was changing. And here, again, six, eight people around you, no one else. And uh, this phantasmagoric picture describes isolation quite good. We can see people and some systems and everything is mixing. So, uh, how the isolation will influence on people? How it will influence on their working capacity? I tried to answer on these questions during uh, my experiments uh, within the framework of Mars 500 project, which was a project uh, uh, try, uh, which tried to simulate uh, a mission to Mars. It consisted from uh, different experiments, medical, psychological, and uh, technical, and uh, there, there were like three stages. 14 days of isolation, 105 days isolation, and uh, 520 days of isolation. So, uh, our crew members, uh, they are real people, and uh, as you can see, all crews can, uh, consist from six people, uh, per, uh, because um, in, uh, this number is the most um, powerful, and uh, there are, uh, you will find many conflicts between them. So, the first, the second, and the third. But how I was working with them, what I was trying to analyze, I was trying to analyze interaction in complex system, astronauts, or crew members, life support systems, and environment. Why? Uh, because space station uh, is a man-made ecosystem, and uh, people are living in this ecosystem and can influence on them because they are working with life support systems, and at the same time they are living in this environment, which means that environment influences on crew members. Uh, so. Uh, but for this experiment, um, can we imagine how expensive it will be uh, to build a, a full-size life support system? Well, is it uh, 10,000? No, of course no. It's even uh, not the price of one system. Uh, this number is closer, uh, to, um, closer to the price of one system, but we have a complex of them. So as you can see, it's 
not uh, possible to build a full system. Uh, we need more money, more sources, and uh, etc. But at the same time, uh, we need a tool to explore. Uh, so I tried a little bit different approach. I was using virtual simulators of life support system. Here you can see a wall system. Uh, it is based on a um, uh, closed loop, uh, which means that uh, we try to recycle all crew space and at the same time we try to regenerate all sources. Um, you can see that there are many systems. Some of them um, we use it during missions to near space station, some of them are used uh, during our missions uh, on board of uh, international space stations, and some of them are respected. Uh, but do we have a complex system right now? Um, no, and this is a big problem because for living uh, in space we still need sources and first of all water. So let's move a bit, a bit forward. For analyzing how uh, of nominal situations will influence on crew, we needed someone who will create uh, this of nominal situation. Uh, so it is instructor. Instructor can give a uh, task uh, to crew members, and uh, crew members are uh, working with him. Uh, on this slide, you can see facilities uh, of Mars 100. Uh, there are two living models, and one model with supply, and one model which was simulating on the uh, surface, uh, surface of Mars uh, for special tests. And our uh, our places um, were in uh, living models. It was two working places for operator, and one uh, place was um, in um, uh, instructor's working place uh, was in the mission control center outside of these models. And you can see how they are in reality. Uh, this is a working screen for uh, uh, as, uh, as well instructor as well operator. Instructor can set up some failures using uh, ONS formation uh, button and our uh, crew members or operators should control uh, environmental parameters and working with onboard systems, which are... Uh, I, I will show you one example uh, how our instructor is given uh, of nominal, uh, rating of nominal situation and uh, crew members uh, are localizing them. So, uh, instructor can find necessary uh, uh, failure in the list. Then operator can see that uh, there is a failure in certain system and uh, can change some uh, modes or to, go, uh, to switch to the system and to localize the situation. Uh, you can see that in the system uh, all uh, necessary mm, things uh, are read and uh, this operator can see what is wrong. And for localization, uh, every time operator needs uh, to switch some devices or uh, to, to make some manual operation. And at the end, uh, he needs to make sure that his system is working. Well, I could analyze uh, how the crew is working using just visual control. Or I can go to our database and check how environmental parameters are changing. Uh, because if it's a uh, very failure, uh, parameters are reacting. But for more deeper control, uh, I was using a special device, which was calling biomounts. Well, uh, it's only part of uh, this system, and this is a biomounts. Uh, it looks like a usual wire mouse with a special sensor. And uh, uh, it looks like magic, but it's not. Look at your palm. Your fingers, they have temperatures, they have pressure and um, conductivity. So uh, this sensor can measure all these things and give us results. And basically, uh, the, the procedure is working like um, a lie detector. So uh, this is not something really new. So how was uh, our experiment? Uh, it consisted from three stages um, every time. First was working capacity test, uh, then uh, our operators um, local, uh, were localizing some failures, and then again they had working capacity test. What for? Uh, the thing is that different uh, phenomenal situations um, create different uh, reactions uh, in uh, human body. 
For example, we had very, very easy uh, offline situations, uh, which was just click, uh, click somewhere on the screen, but uh, sometimes our operators were for, uh, working as uh, miners uh, and trying to find a link in the illuminator, which was uh, much more difficult. And, as, uh, and also they have a really difficult manual operations. Uh, there is a very easy uh, result uh, of our work. Uh, you can see uh, how during all experiments working capacity was changing. For example, one of uh, our crew members uh, made a really big progress uh, starting from the very, very low point and, point, uh, and staying at the end of the experiment only in high position. But we can see uh, that some of uh, uh, crew members had a uh, very, very low result. It means that this time they uh, had, an, uh, had stressful, uh, 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 stressful condition or they were sick or something like that. Well, but it's not only one result. During 14 days isolation, we understood how important is signal and how important is uh, this time delay uh, I was talking about in the beginning. Also, our uh, psychologist uh, made a conclusion that uh, gender mixed uh, crew is not really suitable for a long time experiment. During 500, uh, 105 days isolation, uh, we tried to force our crew members to learn more about uh, life support systems uh, and to give us feedback about ergonomic uh, conditions, etc. Uh, and uh, I can say that this experiment became a small bridge uh, from virtuality to reality for crew members. They are preparing to be uh, a real astronauts and uh, astronaut space uh, tra uh, astronaut training center in Moscow. And also, uh, 520 days isolation um, showed us uh, that not uh, everyone can go crazy <laughs> sitting in a facility for such a long time. Well, uh, I will show you one more example how can we go from uh, virtuality to reality. Uh, my uh, software allows to, uh, uh, to replace a virtual simulator by a real method. Uh, in, uh, this example shows how oxygen generation uh, system was replaced by uh, its uh, training device. You can find the same device flying on board of space station, uh, or you can find the same device in a uh, uh, space training center. So uh, it's a very, very small, but uh, from other side, very big step uh, to create a real life support system. It's uh, not only one idea. We can use this software for many, uh, many uh, operations. We can use it for tra uh, astronaut training. We can uh, we, um, test some, some perspective systems using this uh, software. We can uh, track failures which can uh, appear on board space station. So actually there are very, very uh, many questions we can solve with it. And I would say that uh, this experiment led me to the idea that virtual simulators are not using as well as they could be. And uh, I'd like to encourage the audience to use them more. I'm very happy that uh, in, uh, media and international publicity helped me to show uh, that uh, virtual simulators can be used effectively. Also, I got to say that this experiment was just a little drop in the ocean. And uh, I can say that everyone can make a contribution and go forward, starting from small experiments, from virtual models, and going forward, pushing progress. Thank you very much for your time. My name is uh, Jessica Flau and I am here to talk to you about why we should keep exploring Mars. In other words, Mar Mars is I believe that my colleagues give you already a nice tour of, of ways we could go to Mars with human missions and uh, swarms of robots. But I think they didn't explain enough why we should go to Mars. And so that's what I'm trying to do today. I'm going to try to do. So when I say Mars curiosities, I do not mean only curiosity the latest Mars rover. But what I want to do is give you a tour of the most exciting science facts about Mars. You might already know some of them, 
but in order to get your full attention, I added a few special features. So be ready for mind-blowing Mars images and stories. But first, let's start with this question. Why Mars? Why is there so much fuss about the red planets? And why did we decide all of us to talk about Mars today? Well, Mars has been known in many cultures and has been observed for centuries. It has many names in all of its countries. Even I became fascinated by Mars at a very young age. And I'm not sure I can fully explain how it first started. Of course, Mars is beautiful, right? But I cannot be the only one. I guess that every time I have, I have looked at the sky, I have wondered what it was like up there and what was going on, and if we were alone. And I'm probably not the only one that does, right? Actually, this last point is one of the most fundamental questions of human existence. The Mars is not only the closest planet to Earth, so the most easy to observe. It's also the most similar to Earth. So maybe where we could find extraterrestrial life? But most importantly, and at least I think that's what it takes, I find that Mars is the most curious aspect, uh, the most intriguing planet because of its very curious aspect. Okay, I'm missing some text on my slides, I'm sorry, I'm going to explain to you. And really, Mars secrets is not only my biggest dream. Uh, NASA decided it would be the next step after landing a man on the moon. That is the reason they designed the Mariner program at the end of the 60s. The Mariner 4 was the first spacecraft to take images of the surface of Mars. Uh, a few years later, in 1976, Viking 1 and 2 were the first two lander to ever reach the surface of Mars. They analyzed the composition of the surface and they showed that Mars was sterile because of the oxidation of the surface, the absence of water, and the presence of UV. This was a very big disappointment for scientists. They decided to turn their back to Mars, dedicating no more mission to the red planet for the next 16 years. Yes. So Mars got a second chance only can you change this slide please? Only 16 years later with the Pathfinder mission. Pathfinder landed on Mars in 1996, so 20 years after the Viking rovers. Since then we have had four additional um, four, uh, four additional spacecraft, three rovers and one lander sent to the red planet. You could think that after having so many missions to Mars, we should know everything by now about this cold, dry body. But on the contrary, the observation is revealing new features, new structure, new faces, raising new questions. So let's see what they ask now. And I want to start with what is to me the most amazing science discovery of this decade so far. The Mars Express instruments have shown that high-protein minerals are commonly detected at the surface of Mars. High-protein minerals are minerals that contain water, H2O, in their structure. So they require liquid water to form. Okay, maybe you will tell me this is the 10th time we have announced we have found water on Mars. And this is true. We actually know since the minor mission that there was liquid water in the past of Mars at its surface as evidenced by the valley But the high pressure minerals bring us a lot more information. Indeed, depending on how much water is present, the composition of that water, the temperature and pH condition, different minerals are formed. For instance, if you have a warm and wet environment and a neutral pH, you will tend to precipitate clays. On the contrary, the pH is as and we are structure that is brought from this by volcanoes. Then sulfate tends to be formed. So studying the composition of Mars rocks allows us to reconstitute very precisely what was the environment like at the time we were formed, and therefore studying Mars climate history. And the story of Mars, as we know it so far, 
is that the planet likely and occur to be called climate change. Claims are commonly detected in the very old periods, but we call no ideal periods. They tend to form under what warm and wet conditions. Sulfates usually characterize the exterior age sedimentary deposits. They indicate that the surface was likely acidic at the time of that formation. There are known to very few hydrogen minerals found in the currents younger than 3 billion years, suggesting that the planets have been dry since that time. So we basically went from a warm and wet planet to a cold and dry planet, with maybe a transition period that was characterized by an acidification of the surface. How did it happen? Why this climate change? Well, if any of you can tell me, I promise to warm in or her with a very good bottle of French wine. At least the establishment of this Mars timeline helped us pick a very nice lifting start for the latest Mars mission. Curious this, this small rover you can see in the back. The crater, the, the rover landed in a crater where both clays and sulfates are detected. So we hope that it can study on the field the climatic history of Mars. And in less than a year of operation, one of Curiosity's greatest findings is evidence for a non acidic environment on Mars that are very suitable for the development of life, but also very good for the preservation of biosignatures. So past uh, evidence for life. We have to remain careful though, and I will explain to you why with a very simple question. Do you expect the rocks, let's say, in Canada, to be the same as the rocks here in Montenegro that you have in your mountains? Probably not, right? And that's the thing, the rover only tells us about a very, very small portion of Mars' surface and a small part of Mars' story. This is why we need many more of those missions. But this is also why we need to combine the information collected by the rovers or landers with remote sensing data that are taken by the instruments of the spacecraft from orbit and provide us with a more global view. So talking about remote sensing now, you will see that not only Curiosity is doing miracles today. The IRIS camera on board the Mars Reconnaissance Orbital spacecraft is a wonderful tool. The camera is taking pictures of the surface from orbit, so at the distance that is at best 300 kilometers, with a spatial resolution of 25 centimeters per pixel. Yes, I said 25 centimeters. That is the size of the object we can see at the surface of Mars, 25 centimeters. That's really cool. It means that the camera could see a man standing at the surface of Mars and resolve his different body parts. Since 2006, the camera has taken thousands of wonderful images of the surface of the planet. Most of them have not even been exploited yet. We just don't have enough scientists to look at all of them. So among these images, we can observe uh, interesting sequences of carbon dioxide ice forming dark spots and um, gullies in dark linear features. Also, avalanches, moving dunes newly formed craters, uh, current water flows. All of these amazing landscapes actually show us that Mars is in movement. They keep changing over the seasons and years. And this is just a snapshot of what came up in Mars science the past two or three years. Maybe you have also heard a few years ago about another big discovery which was the measurement of methane release in Mars atmosphere. People talked about it a lot because on Earth, the, the prime source for atmospheric methane is biological activity. We still don't know as of today if the methane of Mars 
is of biological origin or maybe volcanic origin or else. And it was actually debated no longer than last week, but was in the newspapers, and maybe you have seen it also on TV. Because the researchers working with the Curiosity rover have shown that they cannot detect, detect, detect the maiden in Mars atmosphere. So it raises more questions about what is the survival type of maiden in the atmosphere, or if the atmosphere is even homogeneous on Mars. And I don't have time to go too much in detail about, over all of these recent scientific discoveries. But my point is that most of them were unexpected and remain unexplained. And one of the reasons we were able to make all of these wonderful observations on Mars is because Mars has no plates tectonics. On the contrary to Earth, there is no recycling of mass crust through subduction processes. It means that all of the rocks that were once produced at the surface of Mars are preserved. They might have been covered, impacted, altered, but they are there. You could find them. Mars contains a unique geologic record that goes back to the formation of the planets in the solar system 4.5 billion years ago. And I really want to insist on this last point because this is often neglected as everybody is so focused on finding life on Mars. And, and I agree this is a valuable research for me. But Mars is not only the most likely planet to host or have hosted life, it also, it also represents an amazing opportunity to study planetary formation and evolution and find out which conditions prevail early in the solar system, after the planet was formed. So the last images I want to show you today were produced as part of my own research about the year. I was interested in looking down the huge canyon of Valles Marinaris. So Valles Marinaris is about 4,000 kilometers long and 10 kilometers deep. For those of you who have never been to the American Grand Canyon, just imagine a canyon that is five times bigger than the largest canyon on Earth. To give you a rough estimate, the walls of Valles Marineris represent a vertical cliff that is higher than Mount Everest, so higher than the highest mountain on Earth. And the, the extent of the canyon is greater than the distance between Montenegro and Greenland. So this is consequently the greatest, the largest tectonic feature in the entire solar system, and also the deepest natural cuts at the surface of Mars. So I was interested in looking down the walls and trying to figure out if this transition that we expect to find on Mars between plates and surface that is indicative of this climate change could be recorded in the stratigraphy of the canyon. And what I found there was very different than what I expected. I observed some very uncommon rocks that are formed of minerals that come from very deep in the underground. These rocks were interpreted as remnants of mass solidification 4.2 billion years ago. They should be about that age, 4.2 billion years, which is way older than any rocks you could ever find on Earth. This is consequently a little bit by accident that I identified some of the oldest rocks on Mars and maybe in the solar system. And these rocks are just nicely exposed deep down in Valles Marineris. It means that if we could get them, we could analyze them. Just imagine how valuable it would be to land at the bottom of the canyon to analyze those rocks. And just picture the view from there. That would be quite amazing, right? And all we need for to analyze these rocks is a friendly theologist who just come by and pick them up. I mean, okay, maybe not that friendly. I, I know I have to admit theologists can work with the hammer. But that's the thing, is that there is a huge potential in this kingdom. And I would love to see a mission landing there. Unfortunately, I have to admit that 
with occurrence, lending capabilities, it's not possible to land in the canyon yet. There are too much technical constraints and the engineers are not willing to take the risk yet. There are actually many places of Mars that we cannot access to set this goal with our current technology. Consequently, we have not explored much of Mars surface or even Mars history. And I think to achieve that goal, that we're going to need more missions, of course, to Mars, to explore new areas of Mars. So for that, we're probably going to need to rely on new technologies. We're going to need to consider, but I think that's my personal opinion, Mars um, sample become missions, because as a theologist, I would really like to have a piece of Mars rocks, really. And I think for that, we're going to need a lot of new Martian engineers, scientists, with new ideas, crazy ideas, and we're probably even going to need some unmarked astronauts because we can, we thought we can live in all of Mark's dark little secrets. So who knows? Maybe you can be part of it and you will. So if there is only one message to take home from this talk, is that we don't know that much about Mars and there is still plenty to be discovered. I like to think that Mars' story is still to be written and that I can be part of it and that even you can be part of it too. I think Mars has been popularized a lot by uh, science fiction writers and filmmakers and now picturing yourself living on Mars in 60 years from now seems like normal for many people. But I want to remind you that we don't know Mars, we haven't heard of Mars and we don't know all about it. Don't think, it's, don't think it's acquired, don't think it's done. We're not done with Mars. Research takes a lot of time, and its conclusions are not frozen. It keeps evolving as a function of the new evidence we found. And we actually have to keep changing our minds about what could have happened to Mars. In the 70s, we thought Mars was a, just a big desert and nobody could live there. In, in, in 2000, we thought there was maybe a notion of Mars. And now we're talking about this climate change, and we're not even sure about it completely. So be careful. I think planetary science and space science in general is a fairly young discipline. A lot has been found over the past three, four decades. But a lot more remains to be found in the future. So if I can leave you with only one piece of advice, it's just to keep looking up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jess. Um, we are at our final speaker. If you want to see where that actually is. Yeah, that is the end of the Okay. Our last speaker is Sina and my friend, from, also from ISU, from the National Space University. Um, the entire crew that you see tonight here are all people from the International Space University Summer Program. Uh, Sina and I had an amazing honor to be here uh, as participants in 2012 when we were in the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And uh, we are kind of to blame for this entire setting because we believe that we should share the experiences of these people and also their ideas about where things are going to you and so you can have um, a, better, a better idea of how you or maybe somebody you know who is very passionate about this kind of information who you can share this information too can participate as well at some point. Um, we really believe that uh, we should not keep our heads closed in, in a society that we are in. We've learned we had an opportunity to be all around the world and see a lot of options. And uh, we think that this kind of information gathering or information acquiring from, from in a, in a formal setting like this can be very helpful for everybody. Davish is, is a very interesting guy. He's uh, been on basically all the continents. Uh, on the planet. I'm ready, I'm ready. Yeah, he's ready. You come here. <coughs> and uh, he's 
we did a very interesting like set of talks with a, a lot of very very important influential people around the world, and he's going to tell you a little bit about leadership. And yeah. So I'm the last one. I'm going to start with a beautiful poem. It's a it's a poem written by the Sufi poet Rumi in the 13th century in Arabia. It's a coincidence. And uh, and Rumi says that the breeze at dawn has secrets to tell you. So do not go back to sleep. You must ask for what you really want. Do not go back to sleep. People go back and forth between the worlds at that hour. So do not go back to sleep. You must ask for what you really, really want. So do not go back to sleep. And the question is, how many of us really know when they woke, they, when they wake up in the middle of the night, what they they really want to do in life? What is their burning desire, their burning passion? How many of us know how to listen to the voice of the heart speaking to us before the dawn? And uh, how many of us know even during the day what we really, really want in life? Just like many of you here today, I was a normal child growing up, growing up in a normal, uh, in a normal town in Romania, finishing up from a normal university and starting up in a 9 to 5 job. However, when I was 24 years old, something happened and uh, I lost my mind. At least, this is what my, my parents believed, this is what my friends and colleagues of work and in the university, this is what they believed about me. Because one day when we were just having a cup of coffee in a coffee shop, out of the out of the blue I told them, you know my friends, this year I want to go to explore Antarctica, I want to go explore the North Pole, I want to see the coldest regions in the world, I want to see the glaciers, the penguins, and the northern lights in the North Pole. And I guarantee you, this was not normal for anyone. And, um, however, when I found myself saying these kind of things, I had many ideas in the past, but this time was different, because this time I actually allowed for the possibility that my idea can become real. So, I had no money, no high connections, I didn't have any idea of how can I do it, okay, how, you're just a guy from Eastern Europe, how do you travel to Antarctica? You have no money, you don't know who to call, you have no idea how to start. So, what I've done, I, I just began following any idea that came to my mind. So, I wrote to every single polar institute in the world to ask them if I can go on one of their expeditions with them. Obviously, they said no. I, uh, I tried getting a job at one of the research centers in Antarctica. Anything, washing dishes, being the truck driver, I would have done anything to do this. If not, nothing worked. I even called NASA one day, asking them, are you willing to take me with you aboard uh, your plane, going to Antarctica to, to deliver supplies? And who is this crazy guy calling us? I would do anything. I tried to, to get a job on a bunch of tools ship to wash dishes. I was doing a PhD at the time in space engineering, and I said, what if I do a proposal and the European Union is the money? Nothing worked. I was hoping for a scholarship, nothing. I spent half a year every day for, for six months, day and night, following any idea that came to my mind. And I want to ask you, how many of you know or have experienced the, the pain that you feel when you have a dream and you don't know how to accomplish it? Yeah. But you know the feeling, right? Okay. However, as the poem says, the breeze at dawn had secrets to tell me so. I woke up one night at 3 a.m. with an idea. And if you ever get an idea at 3 or 4 a.m. in the morning, usually it happens over and over again. If you get an idea at that time of night, just follow it because ideas are very powerful when it comes at that night. Because at that time of the night, which is called the magic hour or the golden hour, ideas come directly from spirit or from the human heart to the sound say. All the mind is sleeping, all the opinions of others are sleeping, and the ideas you get at that time of night are very powerful. So this is the naive idea I had. My passion, the easiest thing for me in those times was, uh, was photography. So I said, why am I not just being honest about who I am? And I ask companies or whoever can take me with them, I'm going to take pictures for you, can you please take me with you on your ship? 
And I sent an email to every single company in the world who had a ship going to Antarctica. And to my surprise, the great majority of them simply ignored me. How people do. <laughs> Some of them, they said no. But only one, a single company from South America, is the other side of the world in Chile. They said yes, welcome aboard. You know, when, when that happened, I couldn't even leave my because I didn't have a professional camera, I had no equipment, but I just sent the idea and they said yes. So anyway, I borrowed all your, the equipment I needed and I went to explore the South Pole, to see the penguins and the glaciers. From there I flew directly to the North Pole to see the Northern Lights. This is again the North Pole. The idea is that's how powerful your ideas, your actions, your persistence, your prayers, your hopes, your heartfelt desires are. And in the following years, I had many similar ideas, and some of them worked, and some of them were complete failures. For example, I organized with some friends from the Romanian Space Agency the first simulation mission for planet Mars, as my colleague here asked me. And then I, I, I finished the best space university in the world, the NASA Kennedy Space Center. But I didn't know what made the difference between projects and ideas that failed completely and the ones that did work. And they, they worked in a, in a surprising way. So for that reason, I had to learn two things. And usually if you read self-help books, if you, read, if you go to seminars or uh, attend to lectures, not many people will say this to you, but believe me, it's true. I'm sure that you have experienced them. First of all, following your dreams and following what you want to do in life is very, very, very hard. It's, it's hard, it's painful, and the dreams you have are so fragile that they can fall apart in any moment. And number two, the, the, uh, the pain you have, the pain of you not trying, is a million times more terrible more excruciating than the pain of you trying and failing again and again and again. So, in order to be able to share this thing with you, I had to find out, because I'm a scientist and I don't believe in you know, all the mystical things happening or you can see on the market, I had to find out from the best minds in the world what allowed them to reach such high levels of success. People who spent decades working on their visions, what allowed them to go all the way to the end. I had to find out what was the secret that the breeze and dawn told me and what is telling each one of us. So six years ago, I began a journey on five continents from South America, North America, all the way to Europe, Asia, and Australia, and down in New Zealand. Speaking to some of the best scientists, some of the best minds in the world, to discover how did they do it, how did they think, and how we can do the same. Just to give you some names. I had the chance to speak to the world a dear friend of the, of the person from NASA, the director of NASA, who built Hubble Space Telescope. And he spent 15 years working on Hubble Space Telescope. He's the masterpiece of technology and innovation. He's the crown jewel of NASA and the, the holy grail of space exploration that National Geographic calls Hubble. I had the chance to work with a, a professor from Stanford who sent three robots to Mars. He's in charge of the Mars project, he put curiosity, he put spirit and opportunity three of them together successfully on Mars. And I asked them, what made you persist for decades to work and to fail and to, to go? Because it's not easy to send a robot to Mars. What allowed you to do all these kind of things? And they told me. And it's one thing and one thing only. Secondly, I wanted to see if this information is, is complete because when I was young, I wanted to become a musician. So do musicians work in the same way as scientists? So I had the chance to speak with rock stars. This uh, guitar player, like Steve Vai, who turned the music into magic with their instruments, and they say the same thing, and one thing only. And then I flew directly to Asia to speak with Buddhist monks. And I wanted to learn from them. What is the secret that they know that allows them to just spend decades walking around without any shoes in the streets of Colombo in Sri Lanka? And simply, everything they were doing, just share their love, their compassion, their kindness, and their wisdom. Everyone could listen. This is what they were doing. And everyone said the same thing. Everyone said one thing. And it's so simple, but sometimes so difficult to do for us. And that thing is, 
And this is the thing that the prison don has to tell you. You have to be in love with life. You have to be in love with what you are doing. And not just at the superficial level, but really deep down in your heart, you have to be in love with what you're doing. All these people, they love building spaceships. They love traveling into space. They love their, their science. They love playing music. They love touring the world with bands. They, they love their spiritual journeys. And I have understood why some of projects that I had failed and why some succeeded. Because I was in love with one that succeeded, and I didn't care so much about the other ones. That's the key. The question is, what do you care so much about in life? What is it that lifts you up and makes you smile all the time whenever you think about it? Now, how many people here are over 18? <laughs> many, right? Okay. So, usually as we grow older, we find ourselves meeting the greatest struggle of our lives. Usually, especially in those times, we, have, we are filled with anxiety, we are filled with fear about what the future will bring, the media is feeling our fears. But sometimes, and most of the time, sometimes we try, Almost always, we fail to answer the question. And the way we answer this question changes everything. And simply the question is, who am I? What's my purpose in life? How can I be more happy? How can we even dare to be happier, to ask for happiness, when we don't have the courage to be honest with ourselves? That's the key question that I'm asking grown-ups. How can we ask for happiness when we don't have the courage to give our truth? So the only way to be free in life and to be in love with what you're doing is to have the courage to live your truth, to know who you are and to be who you are in every single moment of every single day. That's what it means, what, what it means to be authentic. That's what it means to be in love with what you're doing, to know who you are and to be who you are in every moment of every day. Are you probably wondering what's the connection of you know, being in love and doing the things that you have to do in life? And maybe authenticity and doing what you love is a, like an esoteric concept, it's, a, it's a not so clear. The thing is, we come into this world with the technology inside our bodies that allows us to know from the very beginning if we are heading in the right direction and if we have the chance to go together. And this technology, some people call it the technology of prayer, some, some people call it the, the, the science of bringing miracles into reality, this technology has been removed from our most uh, sacred texts. This technology is so simple to understand. Think about it for a moment. Imagine a horse, a carriage, and a driver. What is the only way for this ensemble to go somewhere together? <clears throat> the only way for them to go together is to go into the same direction. Now, the driver is your mind. The driver doesn't have the power to pull the entire ensemble together, but it has the power to give a direction. I'm going that way. The horse is your emotions. It's the raw energy of what you love in life. However, you have all seen how dangerous emotions can be in our world without a mind to guide the emotions. And the carriage is simply our body. Without mind, without emotions, it's just that. But this is the key for the three of them to go together. The moment you align what you think, with what you feel, and with what you do. The moment you align thought, feeling, and emotion. And this is the whole paragraph. The moment you align the three together, you make them as one. In that moment, you say to the mountain, mountain, move away. And what will the mountain do? The mountain will not go anywhere. But in that moment, you will have found the power within yourself to climb the mountain all the way to the top. That's the power that we carry within ourselves. When you are true to yourself, when you act as you feel and as you think, that's when you have, when you find yourself, the resilience to, to fail, the confidence to fail, to keep on and to keep on keeping on. And when you're authentic and you are true to yourself, in that moment, Every hit, every blow you receive will only make you stronger. And uh, I love this quote from the movie Rocky. And Rocky says, in life, it doesn't matter how hard you hit. It only matters how hard you can get hit. How hard, how, how hard you can get hit and 
continue moving forward. How hard is it get you to continue moving forward? When you are being true to yourself, every hit you receive makes you stronger. But the moment you are lying to yourself, when you are not true to who you are, in that moment you don't stand a chance. Because in that moment you can become your worst enemy. Because you are attacking yourself from the within. So, when you become authentic to yourselves, when you think and feel and you go and you do and take actions in the same direction, in that moment you learn the secrets you don't have to tell you. So, can I put that music a bit harder? I want to leave you the final thought. And uh, we are seven plus million people in this world today. And from these seven plus million people, there is no one like you. Think about it for a moment. You are totally and completely unique. And nobody can become you, nobody can be you. And from these seven plus million people, if you do not become who you are, you are complete, then who can? If you are not in love with your life, who can be? If you don't want to follow your dreams, if you don't listen to your own heart, who can do it for you? If you don't have faith in yourself, if you don't believe in your dreams, if you don't see how powerful you can be, who can do it for you? And if you don't see the beauty that's within yourself, like around to the left, to the right, behind you, and if you're not kind to yourself, if you're not kind to the others, there's no one to do it for you. So, just to, before I say goodnight, I want to say thank you. I want to say thank and them who you were yesterday. I want to say bless the person who you are today because that's the most important thing and I want to say dream of the one who you can become tomorrow because that's the real power that you carry within to be who you really want to be. So thank you and good night. što ste došli večera su ovolikom broju. Bilo je tu nekih improvizacija, došli smo u prostor koji još uvijek nije potpuno osposobljen za ono što smo mi željeli, ali željeli smo da ponudimo nešto što do sada nije bilo tipično u Crnoj Gori. Ja moram da priznam da su i meni dosadna ona duga i teška naučna predavanja, pa smo htjeli da nam ponudimo nešto što je blisko vama, što je moderno, što je urbano i što je onako prilagođeno nekom vašem uzrastu. Nadam se da smo u tome uspjeli. Veliko hvala ovoj ekipi ljudi koja je uradila fantastičan posao. Iskreno se nadam da ste uživali. Hvala vam. We want to thank to our speakers who flew from so far abroad to come here to speak to us. Hvala i nama svima što ste došli u tolikom broju. Hvala svima. Mislim da je to što ovo hvala, ali ne da se pogledate. Nadam se da ćemo svidjeti opet iduće godine, opet na opet na opet. I ovom se će raditi mnogo drugih naravnih projekata. Oni su opično organizovani od strane Omsalaca, a i otvoreni su za sve ostale ljude koji gledaju da učestvuju. Tako da ako čuvete da nešto radimo, slobodno ću trebali. Hvala večer.
Thank you.